Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Evans at Seattle International Raceway in Kent, Washington, just a few miles from downtown Seattle. The setting here is truly beautiful. It looks more like a national park with a road through it than it does a major drag racing complex. The Fall National started three days ago with over 350 entries from 35 states. It has now been narrowed down to the finalists we'll be seeing here today. Some $350,000 in cash on the line, but more important to many of these racers are the World Championship points available here today. This is the next to the last stop on the year-long pro tour. We could see world champions decided here today in top fuel and in funny cars. Now, these are the factory hot rods, a pair of Camaros here right now. In the far lane is Lee Shepard, who all but has a lock on the world championship for 1980 with his rear and Morris and Camaro out of Arlington, Texas. That's Shepard in the far lane. These are four-speed equipped cars. Here in the tower lane from Reno, Nevada, are the Yule brothers. Brother Brad driving the car here today in the near lane. It's the pro start, a flash of yellow, then the green light. Just four tenths of a second between yellow and green as they move up to stage. A tremendous battle all season long between Lee Shepard in the far lane and last year's champ Bob Glidden. We'll be seeing Glidden later on in this round. They are pre-staged, inching forward very, very carefully to get exactly on the starting line, the finish line, a quarter of a mile away, each lane independently, electronically timed. If they leave too soon, they'll draw a foul, the red light, and be automatically eliminated. It looks like a dead even start, but going over the center line is Brad Ewell, and that will automatically disqualify him. Lee Shepard takes the win in the right-hand lane. Shepard with his parachute breakout to stop him. The pro stocks just in the last few years going to parachutes, but there was a foul of a different kind. Okay, here is the replay, and you see right there over the center line, disqualified is Brad Ewell. Lee Shepard would have won it easily anyway. Ewell was just giving it all that he had. Here in the tower lane in a Hemi-powered Dodge belonging to Bob Lambeck from Southern California is Butch Leo in the right-hand lane. Another Hemi-powered Chrysler Corporation car, Ken Dondero of Balboa Island, California. And it looks like Dondero, oh, and from behind comes Butch Leal to win it here in the tower lane. Dondero appeared to have a lead just uh, 50 feet from the finish line, but with more horsepower, Dondero gets around him. Here we see it at low, and it's Butch Leal winning it here in the tower lane by less than a car length. Back on the starting line again. A 427 Cubic and Chevrolet Camaro here in the tower lane from Hammond, Indiana. That's Joe Satmurray. In the right-hand lane, a Pontiac Trans Am. Andy Manorino from Detroit, Michigan. Another good green light start, and they are dead even. The fans love this kind of super competitive pro stock racing. It looks like, we can't call it, the electronic wind light says it is the far lane. It is Andy Manorino in the Trans Am. And one of the closest races yet, less than a tenth of a second separating the two cars at the far end, an 8.44 to 157 miles an hour for Manorino to a losing 8.55. Here is John Hagen of Minneapolis, Minnesota. That is a Hemi Plymouth Arrow in the right-hand lane. It's another Camaro. This one's going Iacocchio from New Jersey. And it looked like a tremendous hole shot advantage right off the line for Iaconio. He was the champion here last year, and he survives round one. Iaconio with an 8.43 and up. Iaconio with another of his patented hole shots. He is acknowledged as being one of the better drivers in pro stock. So his reaction time was better off the line, and that spelled the difference. An 843 winning time at 159 miles an hour. Here in the tower lane, just about the only Mercury Zephyr in drag racing, it's Lee Hunter from Irvine, California. In the right-hand lane, former national record holder Kevin Rotti of Tucson, Arizona. It is Chevrolet against the Ford product, the Mercury here in the tower lane. And with an advantage off the starting line is Kevin Rotti, but can he hold on to it? Here comes Lee Hunter. It is Roddy by several car lengths in the right-hand lane. The driver out of Tucson, Arizona at 8.56, 156 miles an hour will put him into round number two. Jeff Wittig here in the tower lane. This is a local car out of the northwest area, Port Orchard, Washington to be exact. And this is a Ford Pento. In the right-hand lane, a little more up-to-date car out of Yuma, Arizona. Gordy Rivera in the right lane. Rivera with a 327 cubic inch Chevrolet engine up against 330 inches of Ford power here in the tower lane. And the fans love these Ford versus Chevrolet confrontations. That's one of the real positive things about Pro Stock is the make-to-make -make battle going on all the time between the Fords and the Chevrolets and the Trans Ams. 
Normally, the pro stocks stage very quickly, but these two seem to be having a bit of a duel. They have both pre-staged, but neither seems to want to move forward. Finally, it is Whittick that does here in the near lane. Rivera still taking his time, not being pressured, not being psyched out. They're ready. And it is a red light here in the tower lane for Whittick, and that was really kind of predictable. Performance-wise, he was quite a few tenths of a second off the pace being set by Rivera. Rivera beats him anyway, red light or not. So Rivera wins it twice, once on the starting line with a foul start, and uh, still gets to the quarter mile finish line first. Here is Gary Bose from Tacoma, Washington, here in the tower lane. In the right-hand lane is Dempsey Hardy from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with the Chevrolet product. And get oh, and we may have a crash. We do a horrendous pro stock accident right in front of our ESPN cameras. Statistically, the pro stock cars are the most dangerous to drive, and certainly that's proven here by Dempsey Hardy in the Jerry Hurley car. I believe there's an indication that he is okay. He's conscious. We can see him moving around. Took a terrible tumble over the guardrail. Waiting for some official word at the far end, and it appears that they're having a little trouble getting him out of a badly damaged automobile. What apparently happened was the engine exploded and put some oil under the tires and made it impossible for Dempsey Hardy to drive this machine. Here you see the engine blows. You see the smoke, oil going under the tires. The car comes 180 degrees, and there is what they fear the most, bouncing right down the knife edge of the guardrail. It can cut a car and a driver in half, but fortunately for Dempsey Hardy, a many-time national champion, he's shaken, but appears to be all right. We see Butch Leal there on the left in the driving suit, another of the pro stock drivers who was on the return road and ran over to try to help. The NHRA safety safari team, paramedics on the scene immediately. And Dempsey Hardy, as you can see, is okay. It's just been announced on the PA, and the crowd is really responding because I think most of the folks felt that Dempsey would have to sustain some kind of an injury in that incredible pro stock crash. Let's take one more look at it, a little bit slower. Now, you'll see a little smoke start to come from the back of the car. That's when, apparently, the engine breaks. There it is. Now you see oil coming under the rear tires. At this point, it's impossible for Dempsey Hardy to control this vehicle. He is trying, though. But there's no traction for the rear wheels. All of a sudden, it just swaps ends on him. 180 degrees through the grass and slams into the guardrail. And now, twist and bounce right down the knife edge of the rail. You can see Dempsey take a shot from the rail itself. And I'll tell you what a testimony to the safety features demanded by the National Hot Rod Association and to the talents of the men that build these cars to the rules. Incredible. The rear end coming completely out of the car. A $50,000 race car has now been uh, turned into just junk. Nothing will be saved except MC Hardy, and that's the most important thing. We'll be back with more of the NHRA Fall Nationals Drag Racing Championship right after this. Hey, Muhammad Ali. A race in the first round of pro stock competition. In the far lane, the dominant driver in all of pro stock, Bob Glidden of Whiteland, Indiana. Glidden, the four-time world champion, hence the big number one on his window. He has won something like 300 of his last 330 starts. Just an incredible record. In the near lane, upset-minded is the Chevrolet from San Diego of Larry Johnson. It would definitely be the biggest thrill of Johnson's uh, three-year drag racing career to get by Bob Glidden. And if he did so, I think the Chevrolet fans would tear down the grandstand. The odds have got to go with Glidden. Look for Johnson to try to get him off the starting line. What they call a hole shot. And he got a little bit of an advantage, but he red-lighted Looking back at the Christmas tree, the red light is a glow, but it doesn't matter as Glidden drives around him. Bob Glidden in the far lane, parachute out the white Ford Fairmont, taking this win in the first round. Glidden. You can see Larry Johnson had the whole shot, but if you could uh, look behind him, you'd see that there's a red light on the tree. He left too soon. It was really the only chance he had. Glidden records an 8.38 winning at 158 miles an hour, and that concludes the first round of Pro Stock. These are the fastest cars NHRA Drag Racing has to offer Top Fuel Eliminator. We pick up Top Fuel in the second round, or the quarterfinals, if you will. 16 cars qualified. Eight are now left as we go into the second round of competition. This 
is Shirley Muldowney, the number one lady in all of motor racing worldwide, the only woman to ever win a world championship in any kind of motorsport. She won it a few years ago in Top Fuel Eliminator. Shirley Muldowney will be up against the man in the far lane who hopes to win the world championship this year. It's Gary Beck of El Toro, California. Beck was the world champion back in 1973. Hopes to be the first driver to ever win two top fuel world championships. No one has ever done that, amazingly enough. Now, Shirley Muldowney is third in points right now. Beck is number one, but Jeb Allen, whom we'll be seeing later on in this round, is right behind him, just a few hundred points. The tire heating burnout. an absolute must for these 2,000 horsepower machines to lay down a hot strip of rubber and to heat up the tires. That's Shirley, the pink car in the near lane from Mount Clemens, Michigan. Beck will be the blue car in the far lane. These cars only weigh about 1,500 pounds. It's virtually an unlimited class. They burn nitromethane fuel at the cost of about $25 a gallon, and they'll burn 12, 15 gallons a run. So uh, it's professional racing all the way and very, very expensive. The engines behind the drivers, hard to believe uh, just a dozen years ago they were in front of the drivers, and a lot of uh, men have the scars to prove it, as hot parts and hot oil were the order of the day. Fire is still the biggest danger in the funny car competition we'll see later, but now the fire is behind the drivers in top fuel and these rear engine creations. Now, Gary Beck, if he gets eliminated here, could leave this fall nationals event behind in the points, depending on how Shirley and Jeb Allen do. Beck had a seemingly insurmountable lead just a few months ago, but it has rapidly diminished. Shirley Muldowney, her son John, Running away from the car, the crew chief is Ron Tober. Surely a very aggressive driver. She only weighs about 100 pounds. The car built right around her. So it is very, very slippery. And a, just a needle almost going down the racetrack. Pushes very little wind. Now, Shirley is known as a cat off the starting line. Extremely quick. Gary Beck, a very steady lever. Never early, never late. So here's Shirley in the tower lane, trying to gain points and close the gap between herself and Gary Beck. Both of these drivers, former world champions, they're staged and ready. Here's the race, and it appears that Gary Beck may have been out first. Gary Beck with a bit of a lead, but here comes Shirley Muldowney, and it is Shirley Muldowney from behind one of the greatest races of the day. So Shirley Muldowney stops Gary Beck's quest for world championship points here at the Fall Nationals. There you see it. By less than a car link, it's Shirley Muldowney in the near lane over Gary Beck, and I'm sure wherever he is, Jeb Allen, the number two man in points, let out a whoop there. And here comes Jeb Allen right now, and he's got to have a big grin on his young face as he saw Gary Beck go away, which means if Jeb gets the win light here, they'll be virtually tied for the world championship with only one more race to go after this fall national. Jeb Allen completing his burnout in the first round. Jeb defeated the number one qualifier, Jerry Ruth of Seattle, as Ruth had an engine explode. And here is Ernie Hall, Jeb's opponent, here in the second round. Ernie Hall from Cornelius, Oregon. Two distinctly different engines powering these cars. The aluminum Keith Black hemispherical engine for Jeb Allen and what they call the Donovan here in the tower lane. Also an all-aluminum engine designed specifically for drag racing purposes. Jeb Allen has never done anything but drag race for a living. He was the youngest ever top fuel major event winner when he was just 18. He now has seven major events to his credit. He's 24 years of age right now. Races to eat, as do many of these drivers. But Ernie Hall, he's a manufacturer of fire trucks in Cornelius, Oregon. And uh, the cleanliness of uh, his yellow race car is very similar to that of the firefighting equipment. Just immaculate, always. So Hall, pretty much a hobby racer. He does it uh, to beat his friends and to have a great time. Hopefully, he can win enough prize money to at least break even. But for Jeb Allen, he's got to do more than break even, or it affects his lifestyle. For Allen to win a world championship would be a tremendous boost to his career, obviously. And now with Gary back out, a win light here will move Jeb. Just about a deadlock between the two, as far as points are concerned. As the season winds to a close, Jeb Allen moving up first in the far lane. He lights the three stage. He'll wait for Ernie Hall before he moves any further. All coming in now. Jeb races far more than Ernie Hall does, so maybe a little quicker on the Christmas tree starting system. They're off. A good green start for both drivers, and it's Ernie Hall with a bit of a lead. What an upset this could be over Jeb Allen, but it is Jeb Allen by only inches at the far end. 
Jeb Allen with a 6.03 lap time, 240 miles an hour. Here you see Jeb drive around. Ernie Hall ran 6.10, 230 miles an hour, seven one hundredth of a second difference. What a race. So Jeb has accomplished his mission here at the Fall Nationals. If he can con continue this kind of a pace, he could leave here the points leader for the world title. Here now comes the reigning world champion. That's him right there in the Gaines Markley entry. His name is Rob Bruin, and he's from nearby in Federal Way, Washington. He won it all in 1979, but has not raced that much this year and is not in the top 10. But boy, would he like a victory in front of his hometown fans right here at Seattle International Raceway in Kent. Now there's some problems all of a sudden with Bruin's car, but here's the man he will face. And this is a guy who has set the pace the past few months as far as elapsed times are concerned, Marvin Graham of Oklahoma City. Graham recorded the quickest time in about five years just a few weeks ago in Indianapolis at 5.68 seconds. Okay, Rob Bruin, even though they had a problem, whatever it was, they got it repaired. Now Bruin will have to hustle, get in there, get his burnout accomplished, and get back to the starting line without inconveniencing Marvin Graham. If he should take too long, the starter would be well within his rights to go ahead and stage Marvin Graham and send him down the racetrack on a single run. Graham recently won the NHRA Grand National in Montreal, Canada. Was one of the top qualifiers at the U.S. Nationals a few weeks ago with that 5.68 that we talked about. Rob Bruin has uh, consistently the best reflexes of just about any driver in top fuel. Wins many, many events, even with slower elapsed times. The cars are independently timed, near lane and far lane. The finish line judge is also a computer, an electronic finish line judge. You can see right now that uh, it would be very difficult to call some of these races with the human eye. Both of them using late model hemispherical drag racing engines. Fuel injector on top, supercharger next, then the racing engine itself. It's just impossible for ESPN cameras and uh, recorders to capture the sound of these machines. Just something you have to witness in person to even believe. They shake the ground. Near lane, the reigning world champion, Rob Bruins, far lane. Number four in national points, Marvin Graham, driving for Mark Danicus out of Oklahoma City. Graham last to stage, they're ready. And it looked like Rob Bruins may have been away first. Marvin Graham and Rob Bruins side by side, down 1,320 feet. It is the far lane. It is Marvin Graham at a five point seven nine second elapsed time that'll be very close to low ET of the event even though Bruins may have had a slight edge Marvin Graham's car launched a good deal harder and he just drives away from this point 244 miles an hour it's a 6.00 elapsed time for Rob Bruins at 234 that is the second 5.79 elapsed time recorded at this event the other by Canadian Terry Cap, who will be seeing in our next race Cap will be meeting Connie Kalita. They call him the Bounder Hunter out of Ypsilanti, Michigan. And here is Terry Cap, who is now tied with Marvin Graham for low elapsed time of this event at 5.79. Just a few weeks ago, Terry Cap of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, came uh, really out of the middle of the pack. Had never even been in a final round of an important championship and won the granddaddy of all big drag races, the U.S. Nationals in Indianapolis, Indiana. So Cap suddenly is highly respected by everybody in the pit. His fear is looking on in awe as Cap runs those 570s consistently. The car, relatively new, as of yet unpainted. Kalita with a beautiful golden red car. Now, Kalita's reverser has failed. He has no reverse gear in the car. Now, the rules say he must have a reverser. You can hand push it back if you can get it back in time. But it looks like Kalita is done. Either the engine lost fire or the reverser failed. And what a break for Terry Cap. Not that he needs them. Now, Terry Cap will have a single run. Will he take it easy and save his parts and pieces? Or will he go all out to have lane choice over his opponent in the next round? The quicker of the winners from this round has lane choice in the next round, and that can sometimes be critical. Should there be an oil down or traction change for whatever reason? So let's see what Terry Cap elects to do. He can just idle down this racetrack, take the wind light, and come back for the semis, or will he go all out? He's going all out into a huge wheel stand. When the front end comes down, the supercharger blows right off the top of the engine. That was the supercharger and the injector you see bouncing down the racetrack. Now, Cap will still get the victory here, but what a thrash he's going to have in the pit area.
trying to come back for the semifinals. The traction here at Seattle International Raceway is just incredible. The starting line like flypaper. Now, Cap pulls off in the grass in case he is leaking any oil. He does not want to mess up the racetrack for his fellow racers or even himself later on. So Terry Cap still with his helmet on, relieves the water pressure in the engine, and it is minus about $3,000 worth of parts blown right off the top of the engine. Okay, let's look at it again. Terry Cap, instantly the front end comes up in the air. He hopes it'll settle down, but it doesn't. As he lifts off of the accelerator, the front end comes down and boom, off comes the supercharger. Fortunately, missing Terry as it actually passed him up, as you can see. Terry must be seeing it right now, saying, stay away from me. That's about 225 pounds of magnesium and aluminum. Taking divots out of the racetrack, you see the raw fuel coming out of the fuel lines as the supercharger tumbles along behind him. And Terry kept very fortunate he did not have a bad fire, which could have burned the parachute off and uh, even made it more expensive and time-consuming. So can Terry Cap make it back? Does he have the parts? Does he have the time? NHRA Championship Drag Racing will continue from Seattle, Washington, after this message. Breed in all of NHRA drag racing, they call them funny cars. There's nothing funny about a $100,000 race car capable of 240 mile an hour speeds, though. And here is Tom the Mongoose McEwen of Fountain Valley, California. McEwen in the far lane will be up again. The reigning world champion and the current points leader looking to make it two in a row, Raymond Beadle in the popular Blue Max out of Dallas, Texas. The number one on his car, designating him as world champion. Now, Beetle has a very narrow lead over a fellow Texan, Billy Meyer, who we'll be seeing later in this round. It's much like uh, Jeb Allen and Gary Beck. The World Championship could be decided here, or they could go to the final race of the year in an absolute deadlock. The Blue Max with a Plymouth Horizon body over a supercharged nitro-burning engine, much like the top fuel directors use, but in front of the driver, making it far more dangerous. These cars weigh about 1,800 pounds. They use a two-speed transmission. Kind of like an overdrive. There's no clutch pedal to be crushed. You simply push a button and it shifts hydraulically. Now, Beetle qualified with a 610. He disposed of local driver Hank Johnson in the first round with a 619. Tom McEwen qualified at a 623, recorded a 624 in round one to beat Alaskan Jim Moore. So that's how they set up here in the quarterfinals. McEwen against this car, the Blue Max. Many think the most powerful drag racing vehicle ever built. They're staged and ready. And it's Raymond Beetle and Tom McEwen. McEwen with an early lead, but Beetle drives right around if something goes wrong with McEwen's car. And it is Raymond Beetle at 6.28 seconds for the quarter mile, 231.95 miles an hour, and uh, dejected Tom McEwen coasting his Corvette down the course. It appeared that McEwen had an awfully good chance here. When the front end dances like that, it means they're hooked up beautifully, not wasting any traction at all. Beetle appears to pull alongside, and then McEwen, apparently the transmission giving way, something in the drivetrain, and just could not get the power to the differential. So here is the Blue Max advancing into the semifinal round. And back at the starting line, the number one funny car racer in most people's minds the sport has ever known, certainly the winningest drag racer in NHRA competition, regardless of category. In this heat, we'll be seeing Don the Snake Perdomo, we just talked about, up against this young gentleman from Long Beach, California. His name is Tom Riding, driving the Joe Paisano Plymouth Arrow. He was runner-up just a few weeks ago at the U.S. Nationals, his greatest ever performance, and here is the Snake, the Army Dodge Omni four-time world champion. Until Raymond Beetle and the Blue Max came along last year, Don Perdomo owned the drag racing funny car category. And he knows that he has uh, not got an easy one here in the quarterfinals. You might have said that a few months ago, but this car had suddenly risen to the occasion with consistent 6.0 elapsed time. Tom Reidig, a college student and part-time race car driver, pays his tuition driving a drag racing funny car, and here comes Don Perdome, a new car for 1980 for the Snake. He is the national record holder at 5.92 seconds. Perdome has been having his problems this season, no secret about that. But even trouble-plagued as he is, he has still won two national events on the circuit of 10. This is the ninth event so far in 1980. Perdome in round number one recorded a very nice 6.07 to beat John Collins of Long Beach, California. He qualified at a 6.09. 
Now Tom Reiting ran a quicker 6.05 in round one, so has lane choice over Don Perdome and has selected the near lane. Remember, it's the quicker of the two cars in the preceding round who has lane choice. Both lanes appear to be equal now. Reitings is ready. Perdome inches in. He's ready. We can have a start any time. There it is. Don Perdome and Tom Reitings. And Reitings suddenly with a fire underneath his car. Tom Reitings hits the onboard fire extinguisher system and knocks the fire out. As we said earlier, that's the biggest peril in funny car racing, fire. That's why they're forced to carry onboard fire extinguisher systems. As soon as Reitings felt his seat getting hot, he hit a button with his gloved hand, activated the system, and now he comes out of the escape hatch. And I think he's got a, a warm seat in that five-layer fire suit. The NHRA safety safari team on hand instantly, as they always are. They'll get the body up, make sure the fire is completely out. Now, Don Perdome runs a very nice 6.08, displaying some good consistency at 238 miles an hour. Here we see it again. Everything appears to be fine for riding. He is wheel to wheel. With Don Perdome, suddenly he drops back. And here you see the fire, apparently a uh, connecting rod punching a hole in the oil pan on the side of the block, and that oil burning behind the car. Generally, you see these kind of fires in the finish line area, where they're even more dangerous. Seldom do you see one this close to the starting line. Tom Reddings is A-OK. -okay. He got on the bottles quickly, as a good driver will. And there you see him picking up his gear to load up, head back to California, and prepare for the final race of the season. The next race in this quarterfinal round of funny car competition will pit number two in the world right now, as far as the world championship points are concerned, Billy Meyer up against Gordy Bonin. Bonin from BC, British Columbia, not far from here, and has a lot of local fans rooting for him. Meyer out of Waco, Texas. Billy Meyer will be in the near lane. Gordy Bonin in the far lane. Bonin won three national events last year, more than any other driver, including the U.S. Nationals. And he is officially the fastest funny car in the world at 245 miles an hour. The fuel injector on top, the can in the crewman's hand being used to prime the injector. Squirt a little fuel in there, spin the engine over with the electric starter. When the engine catches and runs on its own, the starter comes off and the body latches down. The engine comes to life for Billy Meyer. Crew Chief Mike Duger removes the starter, checks things over. The sticks will come out from under the front of the body. It's a Chevy Citation fiberglass replica for the Hawaiian Tropic sponsored machine of young Billy Meyer. When Meyer was only 19, he held the NHRA national record. He's 25 now, number four in the world last year. You see the number on the side of his car indicating his standings at 79. He is number two right now. But as you saw earlier, Raymond Beadle survived this second round. Billy Meyer must do likewise just to keep pace with the Blue Max. Wheelie bars at the rear of the car. Should the front end come up too high, those wheelie bars will force it back down again and hopefully keep the car from going over backwards. A tremendous crowd here at Seattle International Raceway really enjoying the action. You could go to 10 drag races and not see as many wheel stands, crashes, explosions, and fires as we are here in Seattle this weekend. It's incredible. And fortunately, all of it non-injury. That's the most important part. Gordy Bonin, a heavy favorite with the fans, moving up in the far lane. Young, handsome Billy Meyer in the tower lane. His father, Paul J. Meyer, literally founded the self-improvement industry, Success Motivation Institute, very famous individual worldwide. Billy, a professional drag racer. You just never know what your sons are going to do when they grow up. Billy Meyer here in the tower lane. Gordy Bond in far lane. Both of these cars hauled from race to race in giant 18 wheelers, literally mobile garages. Now it's a must win situation for Meyer if he's to stay in the hunt for the world championship. Meyer is ready. Bond is still inching forward. He's ready. They leave together, wheel to wheel. Billy Meyer suddenly takes Billy Meyer with a 6.32 at 224 miles an hour. That is not quick enough to get lane choice over his next round opponent, Don the Snake Verdome, who ran 6.08. Let's take a look here and see where Bonin's car literally got out of control. Appears to be going straight. Meyer right with him, and suddenly the car darts to the left. 
And once he crosses that line, he is disqualified. Bought into a doing a great job of recovery there. Tries to get back into the hunt, but he sees it's useless. Billy Meyer is long gone. One race remaining. Here in the quarterfinals, Billy Meyer crossing the finish line, earning more of those valuable points. Here is Nick Harmon. You talk about an underdog coming into this event. Harmon from Oregon had never qualified for a national event, let alone gone to the second round. In the far lane will be his opponent, a car based out of Pennsylvania, Dale Armstrong, the driver. Dale uh, originally from Calgary, Canada, now out of Southern California. So east meets west, the driver from the west, the car from the east. Armstrong was the dominant force in one of these sportsman categories called Pro Comp, the winningest driver ever there. And uh, all of the racers in front of car hoped he never uh, graduated into their class, but he has, and he is tough. Number four in the world right now in his first year as a double-A fuel funny car racer. That's the speed racer we're talking about. Mike Case owns it. Dale Armstrong drives it. Now, Nick Harmon, he's got to be granted in there. Win or lose here, this has been quite an achievement for him here at the Fall Nationals, and it's got to be healthy as far as uh, getting further support from sponsors and potential sponsors. Fiberglass replica bodies draped over hand-built tube chassis. Collectively on the starting line, some 4,000 horsepower. The burnouts have been completed. The crews have backed them up in those hot tracks, and now they advance towards the starting line. Nitro Nick, as he calls himself, Nick Harmon, in the near lane. Double A, Dale Armstrong, as the fans have nicknamed him in the far lane. Fall Nationals competition, second round of funny car racing. The fans holding their breath here for Nick Harmon. They've seen him race many times, but never do very well, and they are off. Dale Armstrong with a good lead. If he can keep it all together and keep it straight, it is Dale Armstrong, the speed racer in the far lane. And Armstrong records a 6.36 second lap time at 232 miles an hour to Nick Harmon's 6.56, just two tenths away, 219 miles an hour. The parachutes bring him to a stop, and let's look at it one more time. Now, Harmon may have moved just a few hundredths of a second first, but the Dale Armstrong-driven car in the far lane put its power to the ground quicker and just kind of drives away from mid-track on. Again, it's a 636 for the winner, Armstrong, at 232 miles an hour. And here comes the second round of the factory hot rod. Pro Stock, the official class designation, and in the far lane, the four-time world champion Bob Glidden, but he may not win it in 1980. There's another driver chasing him hard. More about that later. Tower lane is Kevin Roddy. It's Ford versus Chevrolet. Kevin Roddy in the Chevrolet from Tucson, Arizona, and what an upset this could be. If that Chevrolet wins, these people will go crazy. It is the Ford Fairmont of Indiana's Bob Glidden from behind. Oh, the fans were on their feet as it appeared that Roddy might have a chance against the most dominant driver Pro Stock Racing has ever known. Both of them with the wheels in the air. The wheelie bar is keeping them from going any higher. And obviously, Kevin Roddy was out ahead of Glidden. What many men have done that, few have beaten him to the finish line. Here's the powerful Ford making its move. And it's Glidden at 840, 159 miles an hour to a losing 855, 156. Here's another Arizona driver. This is Cordy Rivera with a Chevrolet Monza heating up the tires on a stationary burnout. The pro stockers are not allowed to burn out over the line as the top fuel cars and uh, funny cars do. In the right-hand lane is the only Pontiac Trans Am that I know of in pro stock racing. It's Andy Manorino. Manorino from Detroit, Michigan. Manorino in the far lane. The Chevrolet of Gordy Rivera, Yuma, Arizona, here in the tire lane. They've come to the Fall Nationals from some 35 states. Staged and ready. The winner here will meet Glidden in the semifinals. That's not much to look forward to. And it's Gordy Rivera and Andy Manorino, a beautiful green light start. No hole shot for either driver, and at the far end we pick him up. It is, I think, yes it is, the far lane. Andy Manorino, the Trans Am at 8.46 seconds, 157 miles an hour. That'll be a challenge for Glidden. And 8.59 in the tower lane for the Chevrolet of Kevin Roddy at 155 miles per hour. And here's why the fans love Pro Stock. Not only make against make and driver against driver, but this kind of squeaky type racing. Winning by, what, a fender? Is the far lane Andy Manorino. Okay. 
On the course right now is Butch Leal and Frank Iaconio. Leal in the Chrysler product in the tire lane, but it is Chevrolet, the defending Fall Nationals champion, Frank Iaconio from Chautauqua, New Jersey. And he ties Glidden's time with another 8.40. And one of the best speeds we've seen from the Pro Stocks, 160 miles an hour for the Chevrolet of Iaconio. And here is the points leader for the World Championship. In the near lane is Lee Shepard of Arlington, Texas, up against the local driver, Gary Hugh from Tacoma. And Gary is not even in the hunt against a man who very likely will be number one when the season is over in Pro Stock, Lee Shepard. Shepard with an 8.39, the quickest time of elimination, 158 miles an hour, and he advances into the semifinals. More drag racing action from the Seattle International Raceway. Seattle International Raceway. The Fall Nationals Drag Races has everything, including a rare glimpse of uh, the sun for these Northwest fans, and don't they just love it? The college football season is going hot and heavy, and you'll have the best seat in the house for several top games each week if you're a member of the ESPN team. Great games featuring the likes of National Powers, Alabama, USC, and Penn State, and great names like Jim Simpson and Bud Wilkinson bringing them your way each week right here on your top-ranked source for sports, ESPN. Here at the Fall Nationals, we're now going into what's called the Pro Comp category, and it's just that. It's kind of a half pro, half sportsman. Some guys make their living at it, others just do it uh, for the sport. And uh, these cars are restricted now to alcohol for fuel. There's none of the expensive potent nitromethane allowed in order to keep the cost down and the uh, breakage to a minimum. And the car you're looking at right now will be uh, in this first race in the quarterfinals. It is the world champion, Billy Williams, from Torrance, California. A good look at the aluminum Donovan racing engines with custom-made aluminum heads, the injector on top with the scoop, the wing on the back to push down on those rear tires for more traction as the car achieves greater and greater speed. Without the wing, it would just smoke the tires and probably crash. It just couldn't stay hooked up at all to the pavement. So it will be Billy Williams up against a man who has trekked all the way from Anchorage, Alaska, to be with us here, our ESPN coverage of NHRA's Fall Nationals, the next to the last stop on the Pro Tour of 10 races. Lunsford now sneaking out from behind his truck. The motor started. They don't have quite the staccato, uh, ground-breaking sound of the fuelers of the funny cars, but racing can be closer in this category than any other. They still go through the burnout ritual. Lunsford first to do so. And Billy Williams turning his tires into a moving fog bank. Williams won five important national events last year, amassed uh, probably $150,000 in prize money. Williams and Costanji in the team. And Williams getting back very quickly. It's a cool afternoon, and Williams wants to keep those tires warm. That's the uh, prime purpose of the burnout. And in that they do not have the uh, awesome low-end power of the top fuel cars, the Pro Comp Dragsters use an extra gear, another transmission, so it's a three-speed. The transmission is located behind the, uh, between the engine and the rear axle, and they shift them at just the punch of a button. Bob and Mary Lunsford in the building supply business in Anchorage, Alaska. Bob has been racing for many years and was really one of the top qualifiers. Lunsford qualifying at a 673. He survived the first round with a 675. Billy Williams has been quicker yet, though. Qualified number two at a 662. So the favorite is in the near lane. Billy Williams, the number one, designating him as world champion from the preceding year, 79. Here we go. They leave right together. Bob Lunsford and Billy Williams. But it looks to be all Williams on the other end of the racetrack. It is by several car lengths. Billy Williams with low elapsed time of the event for the Pro Comp category. 6.59 seconds, 204 miles an hour. Fair to be a dead even start. Anytime they carry the front end, the front wheels like you just saw, that means they are really hooked up, as the drag racers call it. No tire slippage whatsoever and going to come up with a good number. In Williams' case, the best we have seen in this category during qualifying or elimination for 6.59 at 204 miles per hour. Billy Williams at the finish line first. Moving along in this quarterfinal round of Pro Comp, here is a, a local car, Jerry Goddard, from the beautiful community of Olympia, Washington, just down the interstate away. And from Canada, Jim Johnson, in the far lane, St. Albert, Alberta, Canada. 
A little different engine combination for Jim Johnson. It's uh, what they call a Rodec power plant. It's patterned after a Chevrolet, but has absolutely no provisions for water jackets, no cooling whatsoever. And the alcohol, menthol, whatever you want to call it, fuel that uh, these drivers use in their tank burns so cool that uh, they really don't need any water circulating through the engine or even standing in the engine. So uh, Rodec came up with an engine that just didn't carry any water. Now, apparently, Goddard either cannot get it in reverse, a crew rushing down there to try to push him back. They could stay in competition if they got him back very quickly. Now, they're trying to adjust the linkage to get that car out of a forward gear and into reverse. You see Jim Johnson testing it. It's still in a forward gear. This is the Canadian. Back at the line, looking down track, is Jeff Goddard saying, hey, get me the line. I could get a gift here. It could be early Christmas. Now Goddard went in. Here comes the Canadian, Jim Johnson. I, I, I think this crowd is made up of maybe 25, 30% Canadians, and they love it. Boy, are they loyal drag racing fans. So getting back on time is Jim Johnson. His tires certainly have cooled off, but uh, this track appears to be so good. You wonder if the Pro Comp cars even need the burnout. Very, very tricky racetrack, however. The initial grip right off the starting line is excellent. It's a concre concrete launch surface, but uh, they only go about 20 feet, and suddenly they have to make a transition to asphalt, and that has been very tricky, especially in top fuel and money car. The Pro Comps don't seem to be bothered by it at all. So it's uh, the United States, Washington State to be exact, in the near lane. In the far lane, it's Canada, the province of Alberta, Jim Johnson. They're ready. And it's a beautiful start by both drivers. The Washington car appears to be running away in the big end, and he does. At the far end of the racetrack, 1,320 feet away, the electronic computer tells us, even though we already knew, that it was Jeff Goddard, the blue car in the near lane from Olympia, Washington. The start did not appear to be a factor both on time and boy they are just about even until mid course and uh, the Donovan engine of Jeff Goddard apparently producing more horsepower than the Chevrolet style Rodak and he outpowers them in a beautiful 6.62 is the time for Jeff Goddard I believe that's the quickest he's ever run at 204 miles an hour the losing time is 688 at 200 and the beat goes on as the next pair moves into the burnout area and in the near lane it will be from Santa Clara California, Don Clar. Clar was uh, really an ancient power plant, uh, an iron 392 Chrysler from the middle 50s when uh, Chrysler Corporation offered those in the, the behemoths of that era. And they really uh, got drag racing off the ground as far as the fuel classes were concerned. And now there's so many uh, better power plants available, much, much stronger. And here you see uh, Don Clar's lady backing him up, keeping him in those burnout tracks. If he uh, does not back up in the exact same tracks he burned out, there's no sense doing it. That's where the track is at its very best. If you were to put your hand on that tire pin right now, it would be warm to the touch, quite warm. Up against Don Clark from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, is Kenny Sitko. Here's Sitko, and he is in the far lane. And he has got some smoke coming off that motor. I believe the starting line crew has shut him off. They have. Apparently some mechanical problems. It would have been dangerous for him to make this run. He could have got oil on the tires and been upside down before he knew it. So it is an early Christmas for Don Clark of Santa Clara, California, as he will make a buy run, a gift, really. He could lose, however, should he touch that center line. You can be disqualified on a single. And now a lot of oily smoke coming out of Don Clark's engine. And he better get the parachute out. There it is. This is a very long racetrack, one of the longest ones on the circuit, just about uh, a mile from starting line to finish line. So the parachute is not quite the factor it could be on some of the shorter courses. Okay, you see Clark leaving very hard, the tires wrinkling up as they should. There are only about four pounds of air in these 17-inch uh, wide tires. The car shaking, vibrating just a little bit as the tires try to break loose and can't. And suddenly the motor's starting to uh, give Clark a warning. It appears to be just water. A water cap blowing off the back of the cylinder head there and uh, giving us a rooster tail off the pro comp car of Don Clark. So it will be Don Clark against uh, Jeff Cotter later on uh, in the semifinals. And right now, here is the final race in this particular round. 
and it will be an excitable bunch from Salinas, California. They call themselves the Spaghetti Benders. It's the San Paolo family. Son Steve drives the car, and they will be up against one of the toughest pro comp cars in all the Northwest out of Prineville, Oregon, Logger Joey Severance. There's the Spaghetti Benders, and they do get excited. Somebody once said it reminded them of an Italian pit stop. A lot of arm waving, <laughs> a lot of meaningless signals. They get very, very involved in their pro comp racing, and they are really one of the favorites uh, for the first time in national competition here in Kent, Washington, from the lettuce capital of the world, Salinas, California. So the final race in this uh, quarterfinal round of pro comp is ready. The engine's being started for Steve Sanpalo of Salinas, California, and logger Joey Severance from Prineville, Oregon, wherever that is. He says it's a town of about 65 people, <laughs> not even on the map. Here is Joey Severance in the black helmet looking over, the injector being primed. It's not like a carburetor that has a reservoir of fuel, so you have to get the engine running. Then the high-pressure injector pump takes over, and it runs all by itself. So San Paulo, first to do the burnout, apparently an agreement between the two drivers as to who would start first. Severance's engine uh, being one of those Rodex we talked about earlier. It has no water jackets at all, so he doesn't uh, want to build quite as much heat in his engine as does San Paulo. And here is Severance. A three-time national event champion, won the U.S. Nationals two years ago. Stocky, rough and tough logger. Severance glides to a stop. They don't want to bring him to too quickly a stop. They get to bouncing on those balloon-like tires and can actually do damage to the car. Plus, the fuel can surge forward in the tank and cause the engine to die, so they bring him to a nice, gentle stop. This is the first season that reverses have been required in all drag racing cars. Many times in the past, it was a, the job of the crew to hand-push these cars back to the starting line, but no longer, not 1980. Much more professional, and certainly uh, it saves a bit of time. Joey Severance has got to be the favorite here based on past performance, but on a lap time at uh, this particular event, not necessarily so. They're very, very close. Severance qualified at 687, but came up with a much better number in the first round of 6.63. So I'm sure the gamblers in the stands will still ride with Joey Severance here in the near lane over the San Paulo family from California in the far side. They're pre-staged inching forward exactly on that starting line. As soon as they're there, the starting system will be activated. And we've got a start. They leave right together. Steve Sanpaolo staying with the favorite seventh for a while anyway. But at the far end of the racetrack, he just out muscles Sanpaolo. And a 6.65. Tremendous consistency for Joey Severance at 205 miles an hour to a losing 6.97 at 179 miles an hour. Ballin, one more win light here in the semifinals, and you will lead the world championship points, Chase. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, it's just all working together for us. It's, it's not something that just happened this race or last weekend. It's something that uh, we've been working at all year. It was just like Shirley Muldowney and Gary Beck and now Marvin Graham, but uh, yeah, it was nice to be first if we could uh, pull it off for the year. Well, whatever happens, you're going to leave here virtually deadlocked, even if you lose, God forbid, in the next round. I know, it, it was a good feeling to see Gary lose and, uh, you know, us go on to another round. It's uh, going to be one of the best races that uh, the World Finals will ever come down to, I think, at Ontario Motor Speedway this year. I have to agree with you. Good luck. Thank you, Steve. Another driver who has benefited from Gary Beck's uh, early demise is Shirley Muldowney. Good to see you, and what a tough race. It is. It's tough on everybody. Seems to be awfully hard on parts. Uh, more breakage, more blower explosions. Uh, why? Yeah, I can't understand it. Uh, some good cars have gone out there. People that don't usually oil the track down, they've had problems. And in fact, uh, on the first pass, everything was fine. Pulled mm -hmm. the chute and kicked the clutch in, and a wrap came out. So oh, on a perfectly good motor, it's hard. It's really hard to say what's going to happen. There. You're up against Terry Cap. He had an awful blower explosion. Will he get it fixed? Do you think? Well, I'm told that he has a spare motor and all of his uh, equipment is perfected and he knows what he has in the trailer. So I think he's going to be tough, but we're here to try our best and hopefully with you know, a little luck we might get there. Well, I know you like Jeb, but you'd kind of like to see him. We're waiting for the crucial semifinals in Top Fuel Eliminator here at Seattle International Raceway and the NHRA 6th Annual Fall Nationals Drag Races. 
The combination of power and speed is evident each Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific Time, as ESPN brings you the exciting EPA Full Contact Karate. Be with your Total Sports Network each week to see who can withstand the many physical demands of an incredibly punishing sport, TKA Full Contact Karate, Wednesdays on ESPN. Here we go into the semi-final round of the world's fastest accelerating vehicles, top fuel eliminator at the Ball Nationals. Jeb Allen, first to do his burnout. A win light here means Jeb Allen commands the World Championship points chase. That's on his mind, but certainly most important is winning some $20,000 here with the Ball Nationals title. Now, he is up against the quickest driver of this entire event from Oklahoma City, Marvin Graham. In the previous round, Graham came up with low elapsed time at the event, covering the quarter mile in an amazing 5.79 seconds. Jeb Allen's best run has been a 5.81, and that was back in qualifying. He has not run that good in eliminations. So it's Jeb Allen against Marvin Graham. Graham in the near lane, the TR3 resin blade special of Mark Danicus. Graham, a former television repairman who now drag races full time and has since he won the U.S. Nationals a few years ago, completely unheralded. Now the winner here will advance to the final round. Points-wise, Jeb Allen needs it badly. And all of a sudden, quite a bit of smoke coming off of Jeb Allen's car. His crew huddling around the engine, tightening something up. That's the car over in the far lane. You see the back of one of the crewmen. He backs away, but still, quite a bit of smoke coming off that engine. It may just be some oil on the... Uh, Exhaust pipes from uh, the thrash between rounds. The car sounds good and launches very hard on what they call the dry burnout. So the tires are heated and ready. The engines are up to temperature. And they move forward. Jeb Allen in the far lane, the kid from Santa Rosa, California. Drag raced all his life, the only occupation he's ever known. Here's the Christmas tree starting system. They're free stage. Jeb Allen moves in. Marvin Graham lights his light. Here's the start. And they are off together, Marvin Graham. In the middle of the racetrack, just running away from Jeb Allen by at least a car length. And Marvin Graham hurts the motor, but who cares? They've got spare parts. They'll fix it as they go into the final round, and Marvin runs 5.94 seconds, 232 miles an hour, to Jeb Allen's 6.08, 222 miles an hour. Jeb Allen told me earlier he'd rather race anybody in the track except for Marvin Graham. He just had a feeling that he was not going to be able to match horsepower with the fellow from Oklahoma City, and that's just the way it worked. Jeb left to right with him, stayed with him till mid-track, but at the other end, it's all Marvin Graham at the finish line. Now, who is going to race Marvin Graham in the final at the Fall Nationals? Will it be the fabled pink car? They call her Wonder Woman from Mount Clemens, Michigan. Simply Shirley on the side of that car. That's all you've got to say. They know it's Shirley Muldowney a former world champion, number four in the world last year, and now with Jeb Allen out, Shirley Muldowney, if she could win this fall nationals, could move up so close to the world championship title with only one race left on the circuit. As predicted, this fall nationals is a crucial race. But let us not forget fall nationals titles themselves at stake, and we see a crewman with a single finger up in the air. That means a single run for Shirley Muldowney. Terry Cap's car will not start. Now remember, Cap had a tremendous blower explosion in the prior round, and the new engine just did not want to respond. It would not start. Terry Cap is already out of the car. Shirley Muldowney will waltz into the final round against Marvin Graham. The car that won the U.S. Nationals, number 627, top fuel, being silently pushed back into the pit area. As everyone looks on, now will Shirley Muldowney go for lane choice? To have lane choice over Marvin Graham, she must run quicker than 5.94 seconds. That's the time that Graham just put on the board. So will she take it easy, save her parts, and let Marvin tell her which lane, or will she go for it? I think she'll go for it. She's that kind of a lady. A hundred pounds of sheer energy and Fortitude, an amazing woman, the most successful in the history of motor racing. Shirley Muldowney launches like a bullet. She is liable to get lane choice. She must beat a 594. She did it. A 587, 242 miles an hour. Will definitely make Shirley Muldowney the favorite going into the final round of top fuel eliminator as she will have lane choice over 
Marvin Graham. That's quite a decision that a driver has to make when you consider it costs three to four hundred dollars to simply make a run down the quarter mile even if you don't break anything. Now it's time for the funny cars and the fans are on their feet because the world champion Blue Max Raymond Beadle will be in this first heat. From Seattle, Washington. Waiting the first race in the semifinals, one of the most important single funny car confrontations of the 1980 season. It's Raymond Beadle against Billy Meyer, the top two cars in the country right now. If Raymond Beadle can defeat his fellow Texan, Billy Meyer from Waco, he would literally ice the world championship for the second consecutive year. If Billy Meyer, that Hawaiian Tropic Chevy Citation you see right now, can defeat the awesome Blue Max from Dallas, it could be Billy Meyer going into the final race of the year later on in Ontario, California, with not the points lead, but certainly much, much closer and an incredible threat. Now, all of a sudden, there's a lot of people huddled around Billy Meyer's car. Here we get a look at the Blue Max. Uh, all is calm and ready there. But suddenly, over on the other car, we see all kinds of people from other crews all of a sudden lending a hand as something appears to be wrong and it looks like the clutch area or the transmission area they're working right behind the back of the motor and suddenly they all back off the crew chief on the car mike Guger, clears them away and says i'm ready to start it the battle of the texans this is war not only is the fall national title potentially at stake the winner going into the final round but the world championship and some $25,000 in bonus Winston money could be decided right now here at the Fall Nationals in front of our ESPN cameras. This could be a classic. Raymond Beadle had lane choice. He was quicker in the quarterfinals, and he selects the near lane. The Blue Max, Godzilla on a leash. They have got more horsepower than any other drag racer in the United States, but sometimes horsepower is not the answer. You've got to put it properly to the racetrack. Too much power, you smoke the tires, lose traction, and you're out. Too little power, obviously, the other man runs away from you. It's that critical balance and keeping it all together for 1,320 feet. The Blue Max has an arsenal in their trailer. Four spare engines ready and waiting at any time. If you like to stay with a tried and proven mount, Billy Meyer, he's also got a big 18-wheeler, and there's plenty of spare bullets to put in that Chevy Citation. If he needs them, if he should blow a motor, there'll be no problem finding another one for the final round. The World Championship, for all intents and purposes, at stake here right now, not to mention a final round berth for the Fall Nationals title. So let's call it $45,000 in six seconds. Meyer in the far lane. Much the junior of 36-year-old Raymond Beetle here in the tower lane, a quiet, soft, walking, soft, talking Texan, brilliant businessman, number one in the world, the first man to dethrone Don Perdome in four years. They're ready, and they leave right together. Billy Meyer with the wheels in the air. Raymond Beetle's car shakes violently. It could be Billy Meyer. No, it is Raymond Beetle. In a cloud of smoke, it is Raymond Beetle with the second best time of this entire event the best elapsed time in elimination 6.01 seconds almost in the fives top speed of the entire fall national 243 miles an hour look at them twist and shake as they leave the starting line billy meyer a full car length out the front wheels up in the air meyer does a beautiful driving job what's it down gently here comes that godzilla like horsepower we talked about before as the blue max powers around to 6.01, 243 miles an hour, and goes into the final round. Will it be this man, Don the Snake Prudhomme, four-time world champion? He feels he has been humiliated a little bit by Raymond Beadle, coming out, taking his title away last year, and maybe do it again this year, probably already has. The Snake wants Beadle bad here in Seattle. The Snake with an aggressive burnout, pedal to the metal, and he's up against a savvy driver, Dale Armstrong of Torrance, California, the speed racer car based in Pennsylvania. Armstrong has won 12 national events, but never in a pro category, formerly in pro comp. This is first season with Nitro in the tank. Perdome with lane choice, as Beetle did, favors the near lane. 
Perdome will have to run at least six seconds flat to get lane choice. What a task. Bob Brandt, many times crew chief of the year, out in front of his boss, his main man, the Snake. A drag racing millionaire. And he made it in this sport. A kid that grew up the son of a car painter in the San Fernando Valley of California. Started drag racing at 19 and a legend in this sport. He's known all over the world and hopes to someday try his hand at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Dale Armstrong in the right-hand lane. These guys about the same age. As far as driving experience is concerned, pretty equal. But in funny cars, no one rivals the snake for sheer track savvy. Perdome holds the national record at 5.92 seconds. He needs a five right now to get lane choice over Raymond Beetle and the Blue Max. If indeed they meet in the final. The pre-stage is on. That tells Perdome he's only a foot away. Same for Dale Armstrong. They're staged. They're ready. The flash of the band. Perdome breaks right on the starting line. Don Perdome doesn't even leave the line. It is Dale Armstrong. A little bit of piston smoke, but he won't care. His first ever final round in double-A funny car competition. A 641 at 201 miles an hour as Don Perdome crawls out of that car. Apparently, there was no oil pressure. We'll try to find out from the snake. He knew that something was wrong with the car. He staged it hoping that possibly Armstrong would red light. Maybe he would cross the center line. Don Perdome never, ever hit the pedal. You see the lights come down, and the snake just gives it a little effort to maybe fake out Armstrong. Armstrong doesn't make any mistakes. Stays in his own lane to a slow 641 at 201. Now, he may, he does. He has the parachute out very, very early. So that elapsed time is deceptive. There's Perdome one of the most intense athletes in sports. And he is disappointed. I talked to him a little earlier, and he really felt that everything went right. He had this fall national raceway. And the NHRA fall nationals will be seeing pro stocks in just a moment. The very latest scores, highlights, interviews, and all the news from the world of sports is brought to you throughout the day on ESPN's Sports Center. Our pro stockers already on the line. Here in the tower lane is the man who very likely will win the world championship. He's ahead on points over Bob Glidden, who's had a stranglehold on it for four years. That's Lee Shepard in the near lane. In the far lane is the defending champion of the Fall Nationals. From Tatawa Borough, New Jersey, Frank Iaconio, a lightning quick driver off the line. And he'll need good reflexes as he's just a little off the pace being set by Shepard here in the tower lane. It is Iaconio with a huge hole shot, but then something breaks. And Lee Shepard goes into a final round again. Shepard with a very competitive 8.44, a tenth off a low elapsed time at the event, but still quite strong, 158 miles an hour. And back at the starting line is Bob Glidden here in the tower lane, the world champion who very likely will be, in the near lane rather, who very likely will be dethroned and he may be beaten here right now, but nope, there is a red light for the car in the far lane. Andy Manorino has red lighted, so uh, forget the red light and the image you just saw because the winner is here in the tower lane, Bob Glidden, and that will set up another glidden Shepherd confrontation, and that has been the magic battle all year long. And listen to this. Low elapsed time and top speed of the entire event for Bob Glidden, 832, 160 miles an hour. Pro Comp is the category, and again, it's the semifinals. Four cars remaining of the 16 that qualified out of some 50 that were entered here at the Fall Nationals, NHRA style. And here's a couple of drivers that uh, are delighted to even get this far. A lot of folks uh, figured especially that Don Clar in the far lane would not even qualify, but here he is in the semis, and he's up against Jerry Goddard. Goddard here in the near lane, the Mr. Rags car, you see. Uh, and Goddard posted his career best in the previous round at 6.62 seconds. Uh, Clar with a 6.79, so there's some 17 hundredths of a second apart. You can look for Clar in the far lane to uh, gamble on the Christmas tree a bit. Uh, kind of close his eyes and roll the dice, because it may take a whole shot to get by Jerry Goddard. If Goddard, uh, engine stays together. That's the way we see it here in the announce booth. Goddard looks like a, a heavy favorite if he leaves on time, and keep it all together. Free staged top lights indicating they're within staging proximity. They inch forward. The second yellow lights in each lane means stop right there. You're on the starting line. Goddard's in. Clark's in. 
and it is far. He got the whole shot. Goddard better have some horsepower. Can Goddard catch him? Not. The biggest upset in pro comp history, possibly, as Don Clark with an old antique cast iron 392 Chrysler engine goes into the final of pro comp. Let's go back and see just how he did it. Look at the whole shot. We said he'd need one, and I think he did that. Just closed his eyes and rolled a seven. Coming out is Don Clark. A 681 for Goddard here in the tower lane is defeated by a slower 6.84. So even though he ran quicker, he snoozed a little bit on the line, and that's all it took for Clark at 684, 191. Here is the king of pro comp, Billy Williams. Williams and Kassandrian, the world champion from 1979, won some six national events. He is up against the toughest pro comp car anywhere in the Northwest region, Joey Severance of Brineville, Oregon. Huge tires. No one ever thought an alcohol car would take this much tire. But year after year, they make more and more horsepower. Dramatically uh, different approaches in the engine department. You're looking at a road deck over in the far lane, as we explained earlier, kind of like a Chevrolet, except Chevrolet component. But it's an uh, engine made strictly for drag racing, both car and boat. In the tower lane is the boat and Donovan of Billy Williams. Williams, about five foot five. Very likable guy, and one of the few that has managed to make a living in the pro comp category. And to do that, you have to get a lot of wind lights. Billy Williams going up against a former customer of his. It was Williams that taught Severance and another hole shot. This time it goes to Joey Severance, but a look back at the Christmas tree shows us a red light. Severance tried the same gamble, but he got snake eyes. And well that he should try because Williams ran an outstanding 6.61 at 204 to a losing 669 for Joey Severance at 203. So going into the final round, it will be the uh, the dark horse. Don this is going to be a little anticlimactic for you. You've clinched your second consecutive world championship. Congratulations, Raymond Beetle. Thank you, Steve. Well, we tried real hard, and that round there was a real important round to us. That's probably a fifty or seventy-five thousand dollar round. So I mean, it, we had a little more pressure on us. And I said forty-five thousand. I was light, right? A little bit. <laughs> Walk me through that race. It looked like Billy Meyer was ahead of you. In fact, he was. Well, our, we had our car leaving a little soft, you know, just because of the shake. We had it earlier in the week is leaving real hard and is shaking real hard. So we had the car leaving a little soft, and the car really picked up in the middle and on the top end, which that time we set a new track record running 243. So it was running good on the big end. And knowing you uh, and the Blue Max crew, you'd like to leave these fans with a five-second elapsed time in the final. Well, uh, we kind of lucked out, you know, the second round with McEwen, and I, I, we told Ellis we've had about all the luck today that we're going to get. Tails so, your crew chief. Yeah, so, I mean, if we don't step up now, I mean, we've had all the breaks, and now's the time to perform. So he came through again, and, and the car ran really good, and hopefully in the final it'll run a little better. Now, Dale Armstrong has never made a final round in AA Fuel Funny Cars, but certainly no stranger to the winter circle. Well, no, Dale runs really good. I mean, he's been another fortunate of the luck deal, but he's also one of those that can step up. I mean, uh, Kenny gave him one the first round, then he came back with Verdome, then broke a throttle linkage after Verdome ran all the O's. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, he's been awful lucky, so we sure don't want to make any mistakes. Well, you'd much rather race Dale Armstrong than Don Perdome, I think, today, anyway. It's not as near as much pressure, I'll put that on. The snake looked uh, a little irate when he got back to his truck after a 10-cent part cost him the Vol National. Yeah, but that's just drag racing. I mean, we've all had that happen, and I mean, like I said, he'd run really good every round, and then finally, uh, he'd had all of his good luck early, and other people were breaking, but he was running good, and now at the end, when he really needs some luck, he didn't, it didn't come with him. Things appear very calm uh, around your car. The pistons are coming out of the engine just to be looked at. Uh, appears that uh, your guys have got their act together. On the other hand, Dale Armstrong, it is really a zoo over there. Well, I mean, Dale heard another motor, I think, and in fact, I understand Billy Myers is the only one for the final. But uh, we're, we're checking our car real close again because we don't want to make any mistakes for the final, like I said, because Dale can step up. Does something like Billy Meyer, a fellow Texan loaning uh, the guy you've got to race a motor, does that bother you at all? Really? No, that's part of the racing. I mean, uh, I don't understand why he's doing it because he, unless he still thinks he's got a mathematical chance of winning the World Championship, which he doesn't now. Uh, I mean, even if he won the race when we didn't qualify and he set a national record, he'd still be some 70 or 90 point shy. So that, that's part of racing. I mean, everybody loans other people parts. Well, win or lose in this final round, just clinching the World Champion through stage tonight. <laughs> Probably so. We'll be down to SeaTac again. <laughs> we brought our camera to the pit of Dale Armstrong, who is scheduled to meet Raymond Beetle in the Funny Car Final. 
Dale's not here. The car's not here. The story is a $17,000 racing engine laying here, a dead soldier. On my right, another $17,000 racing engine, absolutely dead. Where's the car? It's back several hundred feet behind us inside Billy Meyer's 18-wheeler, where Meyer and his Texas crew have joined with the Pennsylvania crew to install one of Billy Meyer's spare motors. So all told, what's 17,000 times three? That's how many parts Dale Armstrong will have gone through just to get to the final round to race one of the quickest funny cars in the world. What they won't do for a wind light. What a backdrop for a final round as Pro Gas comes to line Mount Rainier, one of the most beautiful sites in all the Northwest. And as I said earlier, this is more like a national park than a championship caliber motor racing facility. Here we go with our first final of this fall nationals event. The winner here picks up the title and all the cash that goes with it. Lukowski and Erickson. It's Lukowski here in the tower lane, Erickson in the Corvette. Pro Gas is a new category for the National Hot Rod Association. Even though they race heads up, there is a breakout. They cannot run quicker than 9.90. That is the equalizer to try to keep the cost in hand. It looks like it may be an official category next year, an experimental one this year, and featured here at the Fall Nationals. Dave Lukowski here in the tower lane up against the early model vintage Corvette over in the right-hand lane. Now, they leave together, but you may see them on the brakes at the far end playing a little chess game down there. And Lukowski with a big lead, but remember, he cannot run quicker than 9.90, or he will be disqualified. The timer running. What a race. A dead heat, but the wind light calls it in the right-hand lane, but he breaks out at 9.88. The Corvette got there first, but he is disqualified at 9.88. The winner will be in the tower lane at 10.16, 126 miles an hour. Now, here's Lukowski, who ultimately will win this race as we look at it again. Lukowski with a big, big hole shot, and that forced the Corvette to run all out to pull up even with him, and that accounted for him running too quick, but what a finish. Now you see why it's an electronic finish line judge. All right, here's the final in modified eliminator. In the near lane, a loud, snarly little rotary Mazda from Oregon, Terry Horde. In the right-hand lane, most people think the best modified eliminator car in the world today, Dave Hutchins from Fairfield, Illinois. The Opal GC with a small block Chevrolet engine this is handicapped sportsman racing based on the national indexes. And look at the Opal GT come by. Did he get him? No, he did not. The win goes to the Northwest, the Samurai Warrior Mazda C modified compact at 1171, 109 to a losing 823, 165. Here comes Hutchison. He appears to be flying by, but not quite in time. There's the finish line. And you see by a headlight rim. It is the Mazda in the tower lane. What a final round in Modified Eliminator. Here's the final round in Competition Eliminator, another of the sportsman categories. We're just showing you the final in the far lane as a former world champion in this class. Bobby Cross, Cross and Corzine, the team from Texas in the tower lane. Another local driver makes the final. Jimmy Warder with a C-Factory Experimental Chevy Vega from Fox Island, Washington. A big head start will go to Warder. The difference between the national index and the two classes. Now, Bobby Cross sets sail in a much faster director. Can he drive around the local Chevy Vega? Here he comes. Did he do it? Yes, he did, says the finish line judge at 749, 175 miles an hour to a losing 948, 142. In super stock, in stock, and modified income, it's all handicapped racing. And here comes the A. Econo Dragster. And watch this move. At almost 100, in fact, over 175 miles an hour, he just noses out Jim Warder. The engine being started for Billy Williams, the king of Pro Comp, as we go into the final round of this category, which will pit two alcohol-burning dragsters against each other heads up. Williams, the reigning world champion, a prohibitive favorite here against an upstart from Santa Clara, California, by the name of Don Clark. And I think Clark himself is still in shock making it into the final round for the first time ever at a big, important NHRA drag race. There's Clark from Santa Clara. And this is a Chevrolet up against a mighty Hemi of Williams and Cassandra. Now, Clark with a real aggressive burnout. If you'll recall, back in the semifinal round, it was Clark's amazing reflexes off the starting line that put him in this position. He needed a whole shot, he got it. Billy Williams, a veteran driver, 
one of the few who's uh, been able to make a career out of pro cop and sees no reason to go in the more expensive uh, top fuel or funny car and he's doing as well as he is along with his partner cookie kazanjian from beverly hills california they have won a lot of drag races more than anybody else in the past few years in this category so it's a pro start a flash of the final yellow light to green four tenths of a second for the drivers to react to it the number one for world champion billy williams there is no year-long points chase in this category. The World Championship is decided as the final race of the year. Coming up in a month or so at Ontario Motor Speedway, the underdog Chevrolet, the giant killer in the far lane, in the near lane, Mr. Consistency, Mr. Pro Comp, Billy Williams. They are free stage. Who will move in first? It is Williams, followed by the Chevrolet and Clark, and another giant hole shot fight. There is a red light. Back at the truck line. The red light and the wind goes drove around him anyway with one of the better times of the event, a 6.61 at 203 miles an hour. Clark slowing to just 189 miles an hour. As we see it again, Clark tried his patented hole shot, but he moved just a little bit too quick. If you can see the Christmas tree between the two cars, there is a red light glowing in Don Clark's lane. But I think there'll be a celebration among that crew tonight anyway. Their first ever final round in a long, long career. Billy Williams, the Pro Comp Bowl Nationals champion. Due to the lateness of the hour and the uh, diminishing uh, daylight, it appears that the National Hot Rod Association is running the finals a little out of sequence and going right to top fuel because they are in the lanes and ready. And what a final it should be. Oh. For the ladies, we have the pink car of Shirley Muldowney. And for the gentlemen, soon to be appearing alongside her will be Mr. Marvin Graham of Oklahoma City. And these are just the two most consistent cars of the day, and they've really earned their right here in the final round. For Shirley Muldowney, she started out in round number one with a 599, beating a Washington favorite, Mike Palmer. Then in the second round, Shirley met Gary Beck side by side. Beck at that time was leading the world championship points chase. Uh, he no longer does, as Jeb Allen has now inherited that. She disposed of Gary Beck with a 593 over Beck's 603. Then it was up to the pink car to take on Car Terry Cap. She got a gift there as Terry Cap's motor would not start after a violent blower explosion in the preceding round, and now she has earned the right to face Marvin Graham. Already this year, Graham has run the quickest time we have seen in about four years, a 5.68 at the U.S. Nationals, and he's clowning a bit down on the starting line, trying to maybe psych out Shirley a little bit. Now, Marvin Graham qualified if I can find him here on our sheet, these are very confusing. Marvin Graham qualified with a great 588. In the first round, he met Northern California's Dennis Baca. He dropped Baca with another 588. Then Marvin came up with low elapsed time of the entire fall nationals, a 579 at 244 miles an hour, to beat the defending world champion, Rob Bruins from Washington. In the semifinal, it was Graham with a 594 to end Jeb Allen's hope of a fall nationals victory. And now Graham against Muldowney. Shirley Muldowney suiting up the racer scarlet with a Nomex sock over her pretty hair and face. Shirley was burned quite severely uh, some years back in a funny car and forsake that breed. She says, I'm uh, too damn pretty to get burned, was her exact word. So into a top field racer where the engine is behind her and far less chance of a fire getting to this woman who has established herself worldwide as the most successful of all women race car drivers. Coming out alongside our top fuel cars as they get ready is the final round in stock eliminator. So let's move over to that if we can. And we'll see Ray Cook of Hillside, New Jersey, who is the reigning world champion in stock eliminator. He'll be up against Calvin Quiapama of Portland, Oregon. And Calvin's uh, biggest ever drag race, his first time in the final round. Now these are really the closest thing to street cars that you'll see in the National Hot Rod Association's uh, classes. If you were to take the headers off and put street mufflers on them and change the rear end gear, a few other things, you could actually drive them to the grocery store. The rules are very strict as to the modifications allowed. By just getting this far, Ray Cook has earned $15,000 in the points chase towards the WR Grace Quaker State Sportsman Cup. Now here, divide or subtract 1139 from 15.50, and that will tell you how much of a head start will go to Calvin Cuyapama in the slower Chevrolet here in the tower lane. Those are the national indexes for the classes. What NHRA says, a well-prepared, properly driven car should run. You see the Christmas tree, the lights coming down. It's a good green light start for Calvin Cuyapama. Having to be patient is the world champion now 
Quaker State Grace Cup champ, Ray Cook, and can he catch the fleeing Chevrolet? It looks almost impossible, but here comes the Dodge Challenger, a 426 Hemi, and he got him. Ray Cook wins it with a 10.53 at 108 miles an hour to a losing 15.52 at 77 miles an hour. So the handicap system, again, was the big equalizer. Now, in stock eliminator, Ray Cook cannot run quicker than the index. And he managed to uh, keep a tight rein on that Mopar. That's a big Hemi, and it took that kind of muscle to get around the Chevrolet. Right now, Calvin Cuyapama thinks his engine fell out. Ray Cook came by so fast. And on the starting line, as we pick up the pace, just a few final runs to go before we conclude this fall national. Here is the Superstock final. In the far lane is the 68 Plymouth Barracuda. This is another Hemi 426. It's Harry Holton, a car dealer from Modesto, California. In the tower lane, a racing dentist from Alamo, California, near San Francisco, Terry Esslinger. Esslinger with another Chrysler product. It's a 71 Duster with the 340 cubic inch, 275 horsepower motor. So obviously the advantage is going to go to Terry Esslinger here in the near lane. And he takes advantage of it, and he wins it as Harry Holton has fouled. Harry Holton could not take the pressure of waiting. Maybe knew he had to roll the dice as Esslinger was running closer to the index, and it looks like a tremendous finish. But the wind goes in the tower lane at 11.09, 110 miles an hour, and there is that red glow that has cost Harry Holton some $14,000 in the Superstock final. Here comes... Pro Stock. This has been the most talked about rivalry in drag racing in 1980. The Ford against the Chevrolet. The four-time world champion, Bob Glidden. It appears now that he is going to have to give up that number one for next year to the man in the opposite lane. Lee Shepard from Arlington, Texas. The famed Rear and Morrison Big Block Camaro. These two have met time after time this year. It has been Shepard in the winner's circle more than Glidden, primarily on driving ability. He has won three final rounds this year against Bob Glidden of Whiteland, Indiana, with slower lapse times, meaning that he cut the light finer than did Glidden. So Glidden knows he cannot be complacent here. Glidden, the national record holder, at 8.31 seconds. He's in the near lane with the four. The Chevrolet in the far lane is Lee Shepard. Let's see what happens. It is a great start by both drivers. It is, I can't tell, let's look to the wind lights. It is the far lane, another whole shot victory by Lee Shepard. Now compare these times. An 851 wins it, an 841 loses it. So Glidden was again late off the mark. Let's watch it, see if we can pick up the whole shot. There it is, and a tenth of a second is several car lengths sometimes in drag racing. So even though Glidden ran a tenth quicker, all it did was bring him up on Shepard's fender. Lee Shepard for Chevrolet wins at 8.51 to a tenth quicker, 8.41, 158, and here's the, oh, my Lord. Thank God for the wind computer. 8.51, 8.41, virtually a dead heat, but there is no such thing. That wind computer is going to pick one car or the other. Oh, the awesome sound. If only we could capture it for you. It would blow our audio equipment to bits. These cars make so much noise, but it's a sweet sound. The spectators cover their ears and relish in it. Here is Shirley Muldowney. It is time for the Top Fuel final round. Shirley, I think if you were to poll most of the so-called experts in the pits as their driving ability, they would pick Shirley Muldowney, especially right off that starting line. Shirley in the near lane, blistering the tires. One of the most aggressive dragsters, drivers in the sport now. As the sun slowly sets, you start to see the long nitro flames licking out of the headers at the airfoils high over the rear end. The raw nitro spewing out of the pipes and igniting in the atmosphere. Marvin Graham comes back very quickly. Have track conditions changed? The temperature has dropped 10 degrees since the semifinal. Shirley Muldowney, number four in the world. A win here could move her up as high as number two, possibly. And going into the final race of the year, she would still have a shot at the World Championship. In fact, it's going to be a war between Gary Beck and Jeb Allen and Shirley Muldowney. Marvin Graham, who got a late start, but once he hit his stride, 
has been absolutely dominant from an elapsed time standpoint. He is low ET of this event at 579. But as you just saw in pro stock, it still takes a driver to put these cars in the winner's circle. Ron Tobler, crew chief for Shirley Muldowney, checking the engine temperature with the palm of his hand. Look at the flames from the $25 a gallon fuel. Shirley takes one more stab at the throttle to heat up the clutch and the tires. She moves forward. You see Marvin Graham putting a little pressure on her. He moves right up to pre-stage, that top yellow light in his lane. It does nothing but tell the drivers they're close. A foot away. Now Shirley moves in and tucks to Marvin with the throttle. Gives it a whack. 4,000 horsepower. The final round of top fuel eliminator at the Fall Nationals. It has been a classic event. Graham taking his time. Here we go. Shirley Muldowney with the wheels in the air right alongside Marvin Graham. And it looks like it is Wonder Woman. Shirley Muldowney. The yellow parachute out and Marvin Graham is turned away in the final round of the Fall Nationals. Side by side, five second elapsed times of 5.84 as Crew Chief Tobler waits for the time. 5.84, 241.93 miles an hour, an identical speed for Marvin Graham. 241.93, but he was a little bit short in the elapsed time department of 5.91. What a way to end top fuel side by side, five second runs. A 5.84 for Shirley, a 5.91 for Marvin Graham. Marvin appeared to leave right with her. What a great race. So good. Let's see it again. Now watch the front end of Shirley's car. As she lets the clutch out, it just dangles in the air. Finally, it sets down. Marvin Graham doing the very same thing. That tells us we've got an excellent racetrack and that they have the perfect combination of clutch and tire. Look at this. That half track is virtually a dead heat. Shirley finally just inches away from Marvin Graham to a 5.84 victory. Identical speeds now, 241.93. Let's look at it as they near the finish line in replay. Shirley Muldowney, there it is. By a few hundredths of a second, the Fall Nationals champion. What a lady, what a driver. And what a funny car final. Raymond Beadle in the blue max has already clinched the world championship. He did that in the round before. But now, there's $15,000, $20,000 at stake for the Fall Nationals title alone. In the far lane, some exhausted people, the crew of Mike Case and driver Dale Armstrong. Tom Anderson right there, the crew chief on this car. We've told you the story. They have completely butchered two racing engines, just left them laying in the dirt and the oil and the spent oil cans by their trailer rolled over to Billy Meyer's 18-wheeler, actually took it inside the trailer where Meyer installed a fresh engine. Meyer, he didn't like the Blue Max beating him out of the World Championship, and he's going to get revenge, I guess, any way he can. Mike Case, the tall man at the very front of the car with his hands on his hips, he owns the car. Right now, they're just numb with exhaustion. The sun really over the horizon now. It's a beautiful evening, but the, we've only got really a few more minutes of light. It could uh, actually get danger if, it's, if it gets much later as far as visibility for these drivers is concerned. There's a shot of what these men try so hard to get right. The racing engine that powers a double-A fuel funny car. A lot of the fans call them floppers because the bodies flop up and down. They identify with the body styles, even though they're just fiberglass replicas. It's a Plymouth Horizon body for Raymond Beetle in the Blue Max in the tower lane. For Dale Armstrong in the right-hand lane, a Dodge Challenger body. Hardly recognizable, but that's what they call it. Here's the Blue Max, the most successful funny car in the world, 1979 and 1980. There will be no need to remove that number one from the side of the Max for the 1981 season. He's clinched it here in Seattle. Now, how will Billy Meyer's engine perform in the Speed Racer? Who knows? This is not an engine he has run this weekend. They are really guessing at how much nitromethane to put in the tank and where to make all the various settings. Just using uh, the total of experience of some 14 people that were responsible for this engine change. Raymond Beadle, 
acknowledged as having the best crew in drag racing. Dale Emery, Fred Miller, D. Gant, any one of the three could be a crew chief on any other car. It's an awesome operation out of Dallas, Texas. Raymond Beetle even manufactures and sells to the racers most of the trailers they haul their cars in. He's quite a businessman. Look at the flame out of the speed racer. The engine very rich. It looks like the body may be coming up on that car. Let's keep an eye on it. A lot of raw fuel in the air. Anything can happen here. Armstrong backs away. An incredible amount of fire. What is Armstrong doing? Is he even going to go to the line with this car? From the cockpit, he's bound to see the flame. It may just be that the fuel injector is a little off on the low end of starting line setting. Once he puts the pedal to the metal, it may clear up. We'll see. Very little flame out of the Blue Max. The Blue Max is set on kill. They will murder a motor to celebrate a fall nationals victory, another world championship, and maybe even a five-second elapsed time, which would be a track record here at SIR. They are pre-staged. As darkness descends, the Blue Max in the near lane. The thrash together, Speed Racer and Dale Armstrong in the far lane. It is Armstrong out in front of the Blue Max. Can he hang on? The answer is no. It is Raymond Beetle with his first ever full Nationals victory. A 6.04 at 243 miles an hour. Dale Armstrong saw the Blue Max streaking away and just threw in the towel. No sense destroying another $17,000 motor that doesn't even belong to him. A 718 coasting through at just 119 miles an hour. Raymond Beetle, if memory serves me right, has had to drive around past every opponent today. I think he does that again with Dale Armstrong. We'll see. Let's take a look in slow motion. The incredible flame out of the speed racer, but it did perform right off the starting line. Beetle was not late. His car just did not produce the low-end horsepower that Armstrong's did. Now, Armstrong's does not have the top-end power. He feels it going away. His head practically hits the dashboard as the power just absolutely vanishes. And there is your funny car champion, the Blue Max Raymond Beetle, Dallas, Texas. We'll be right back with a recap of this incredible Fall Nationals drag race after we take time out for our sponsors. Certainly, this sixth annual NHRA Fall Nationals has exceeded the wildest anticipations of the crowd, the racers, uh, even our own crew. Shirley Muldowney had to defeat the quickest car of the entire event, Marvin Graham, to earn her Fall Nationals crown. The pink car in the winner's circle once again, and a big move up in the points for Shirley Muldowney. A furious engine change was not enough for Dale Armstrong and the Speed Racer crew to turn back the awesome Blue Max and Raymond Beetle. Beetle winning the Fall Nationals, and more important, really, to him, clinching his second consecutive world title in the funny car category. Now, the big news is in pro stock, an incredible development. If you'll remember, it was the closest race of the day. Only one one thousandth separating Lee Shepard in the far lane, Bob Glidden in the near lane. We called the winner first on the wind light in the timing tower. However, the wind light at the finish line, the ones that the fans depend on, are the final say-so. The win has now been given to Glidden as there was a conflict between the two wind lights. You be the judge. Who won this race? The National Hot Rod Association says the car in the near lane, Bob Glidden. And I'm sure we have not heard the last of this. Well, that's about it from Seattle International Raceway and the 6th Annual Fall.